and welcome everyone to the Bay Area Digital Inclusion Coalition meeting in March. Um, good to see all of you and we're really excited about our guests today. They've got some great information that is uh, relevant and, and pretty important for all of us. So this will be recorded and we'll send out a recording, a link to the recording in case you'd like to share it with others. Uh, in your uh, networks or in your offices or anybody else who you think should know about this really important um, process of developing a digital equity plan for the state of California and things that you can do to participate in it and make sure that your voices are heard. So um, there's Scott Adams. All right, this is, we've got, we've got a really exciting day. To, um, we've got Scott Adams from the California Department of Technology joining us as well. So this, we're super excited. Um, we're going to start out today with Gladys um, from NTIA. So there's all kinds of things that we're throwing around, right? We talk about NDIA and um, NTIA is where, what Gladys is, um, covering and we're really excited about that. Federal Program Officer, the state um, lead for the California National Telecommunications and Information Administration. That's a long title, um, but she's with us. And then after Gladys kind of gives us the bigger picture, then we've got folks from the California Department of Technology that are gonna jump in and tell us what's happening. Um, um, at, in California and how we can get directly involved in the process. So without further ado, let's jump in and get started. Now, off to you, Gladys. So um, thank you again, Carla and Andrew, for um, inviting us. Um, I am Gladys Palpalatic, as Carla mentioned. I am one of two federal program officers from NTIA. Um, we we are part of Department of Commerce, and we are um, administering part of the um, infrastructure grants um, that you all probably have heard of, $60 billion and $42.5 billion of it is for broadband. And so um, there are uh, federal program officers like myself in every state. California is the only state that has two. Um, and so our grantee, um, for this uh, uh, tranche of funding is the state of California, and um, and I'll go from there. Um, let me get back to the slides. Um, what you see here, um, and as Ka and Car as Carla said, I'm going to do kind of the universe, and then I'm going to hand it over to California's uh, Department of Technology folks to do the more on the ground what is happening in California. So this graphic here uh, slide is just a, a, a depiction of the broadband funds that are available and have been rolled out and will be rolled out in California and which departments um, are administering them. You can see at the top that the two departments in California that will be administering these grants are the CPUC or the California Public Utilities Commission and then the California Department of Technology who you will hear from um, later uh, in just a few minutes. Um, on the CPUC side there, on the left side of your screen, um, you will see on the light blue um, row of funding, um, primarily the CASF or the California Advanced Services Fund subsidy program. That is primarily an infrastructure subsidy program that was established in 2008. Um, there are also since 2008, a consortia account established, public housing account established, and an adoption account established. Um, and so that's been, um, a, it's a historical legacy funding stream for broadband unique at that time to, um, to the country. And since then, other states have taken up their own um, broadband funding streams. In the middle, in the white um, row, are, um, are the bucket, bucket of newer funding that was established with SB 156 in 2021, right around the pandemic. Um, and those uh, funds come primarily from the CARES Act um, and are now um, being rolled out. Um, the first one there that you see um, is the local agency and technical assistance, otherwise known as the LATA grants um, that have been um, um, awarded, oops, let me go back up. Um, underneath that is the federal funding account, FFA, 
um, as it's known, and those those um, that funding is now starting to roll out, and the, the rules for it is being are being established, and then the loan loss reserve fund, um, and then uh, finally in, in the red. Um, columns are what we are administering. We NTIA have rolled out in administering, and as I said, they are part of the uh, infrastructure, the major infrastructure investment act, investment and jobs act, IJA, uh, also known as IJA, that you may have heard President Biden, um, and you know, um, remember him rolling out and announcing last year. And we are now in the midst of the first phase of the broadband funding going out. Um, and that is what we will be talking about today, mostly about the digital equity side of the coin, which is on the on the right side of this um, of the slides there being administered by CDT or the California Department of Technology. And then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the bead grants again on the left side of the coin of the, the graphic there, um, which is being administered by the CPUC or the California Public Utilities um, Commission. Um, so I'll go to the next slide. Um, this is the, um, the kind of the deep high level details of the Digital Equity Act um, that is now in full swing. Again, CDT or um, the California Department of Technology ha is, has been designated by the governor's office um, to administer this funding and it is the state planning um, funds here uh, kind of in the middle of the page that they are in the middle of administering um, and they will are creating a state digital equity plan um, and and engaging <clears throat> stakeholders um, since the beginning of the year um, it's a one-year planning phase and grant um, that you'll hear much more about um, that Scott and Laura will will be uh, sharing in just a few minutes. Um, the other parts of the grant are the state capacity grant and the competitive grant. The state capacity grant, um, another state, a state entity will be applying for that. That is the next phase um, uh, after the state digital equity plan will be submitted. Um, the state capacity grant will be for implementation of that state digital equity plan. And um, and so that that is coming, and then after that will be the competitive grant, um, which NTIA my our uh, my um, agency will be um, administering and and putting out again to help states to um, implement their state digital equity plans, um, and and um, and. Uh, deliver um, those the 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 plans that have been identified. Um, you can see at the bottom of the 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 the, the slide the uh, estimated timelines uh, timeline for for digital equity. Um, we we are mid twenty two. We're almost mid twenty twenty three here um, in in the planning phase and. Um, in 2024, um, we will be we should we should have by then the NOFOs or the Notice of Funding Opportunity um, uh, out and uh, into the communities for both the state capacity grant and the competitive grants, um, and so uh, and so we'll go into the next phase next year. Um, let me go into the next slide here. This just really tells, um, uh, illustrates how NTIA looks at both the state digital equity plan and BEAD as one holistic funding stream, even though uh, in most states it is being administered, um, it, you know, separately, but but always needs to be thought of as together because um, they they we really want equity to we really see equity as um, being the heart and leading um, both um, the equity sorry I keep clicking on that leading both the infrastructure decisions and questions and um, gap analysis and so on 
um, in the, on the infrastructure side as it is on the state digital equity side. Um, this is another um, hi uh, high level picture of what the BEAD program um, is, is about. It is again being administered um, by the S California Public Utilities Commission. Um, and they have, uh, and it, it makes sense because they have had the CASF infrastructure subsidy program in place for over 10 years. And so um, it made a lot of sense that they um, uh, were are administering this, this infrastructure side of the funding. Um, and so they are in the midst of doing that. Um, and and have just opened an OIR order of institute rulemaking to institute rulemaking for the bead funds. So um, on the infrastructure side of the coin, if you are interested, if your organization is interested in that, um, you should um, sign up for the listserv, and I can get that information out to you all if you want it for yourselves to follow. Um, and so there is a way for you to become involved there. These are just some key dates um, um, for both uh, programs. We are here now in terms of BEAD and DE, BEAD and digital equity on the outreach side um, now in March and into July. The state digital equity um, broadband for all website, which I'll share um, with everyone and, and these slides as well um, are 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 a place for you all to keep up and and sign up for the list serve so that you can um, keep in in step with with the meetings that are happening, um, and you can see here the funding allocations will be coming along um, for the infrastructure side of the coin on or before June thirtieth. Um, Bead with their um, five year plan is due in August of this year. The state digital equity plan is due in no, by the end of November of this year, um, and so and all and then the bead initial proposal will be uh, six months after the June allocations, and final proposal a year after. Let me see what else we have. And this next this slide just shows you the focused our covered populations um, that both the BEAD and DE grants are required to engage. Um, and so I, I won't read this slide to you. You can see that they are um, underrepresented um, communities or um, um, that, 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 that are, um, are, are required for both DE and BEAD to uh, engage with and get feedback from to make sure that um, they are represented in the BEAD and DE plans going forward. And that is just my um, contact information. Um, and if you would like more information, please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, and also if you want uh, further information or a presentation to your own organizations, please um, please contact us with that as well or any questions you may have. Okay, let me stop sharing my screen. And if we have, and happy to answer any questions if we have any. Yeah, sure. Any questions for Gladys? Uh, Richard, I see your hand went up. Oops, yeah, you're still muted. Okay, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. uh, Gladys, in your, I think it was your next to last slide where you showed the impacted communities for DE and BEAD. Some were red and some were blue. Does that mean they're mutually exclusive or there's some? No, the, no, the color. Yeah, no, the colors were just um, the blues were, I think, for digital equity and red for for BEAD. And so they they were they, even though they, I honestly, we honestly don't. <laughs> We're not quite sure why it wasn't just one set. We've yeah, asked this yeah. we as FPOs have asked this question as well. But really, even though they're some of them are a little different, most of them are are very similar or the same. And for those that aren't in one, really the other takes into consideration as well. So they they are not 
you know, even though there is a, you know, a specific bead set of populations and a specific DE set of populations, really both, both parties are both. That makes funding. Sense. Yeah. 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 So yeah. one, one follow-up question, just, I just, uh, you know, I, we talk a lot about digital equity, but there's so many acronyms in terms of, of art. Could you just say when you, when you say digital equity, what, what legally or programmatically does that really mean? I'm just trying to really want to make sure I've got that idea clearly. Digital inclusion to us is kind of the path. Digital equity. Yeah. So digital inclusion to us is the pathway to get to equity. The, the inclusion is the how in order to get to the parity or the equity of. of, of okay. So equity is the goal. The goal. Exactly. Thank you. Yes. And that includes adoption as well as access. Yes. It is. It, it is. It is. Um a broadband connection, what, whatever the technology that can be, that can, that a community can utilize. So for some communities, that's fiber. We hope it's fiber, right? From our point, from our funding point of view, we hope it's fiber, but we know that in very extremely high cost areas that that is cost prohibitive. Um, and so something, an alternative um, uh, connection there would, would suffice um, if they have exhausted all the options that um, that would bring them fiber, um, and so so at, you know connectivity is one. A device, a device um, is is the uh, is another. Um, training is another because not those two do you no good if you don't know how to use it, right? Technical yeah. assistance right. is is another, um, and for and. Um, there is something else that I'm afraid, but those are the critical pieces. Great. Thank you. Excellent. Unless we have further questions at this point. Oh, Andrew, jump in. Yeah, so, so sorry, Gladys, just on the bead implementation, who who's eligible to apply for that? And I'm just thinking in terms of infrastructure implementation, we hear commonly say in San Francisco, certain housing in the city and especially where some of these covered populations reside and in underserved communities, they have very bad access in terms of broadband reliability. And I'm just curious, you know, is it the city that should be applying for this or should it be some of the housing providers? Or It is definitely the widest um, uh, eligibility um, that we've seen um, if you are familiar with CASF, it has gone through an evolution of having only at the very, you know, 10 years ago, it was only providers, uh, specific providers that were eligible. And now it's much a wider range of um, of uh, eligible entities. And so that for BEAD, it is the same. It, it could be a jurisdiction. It could be housing. As long as they are able to deliver um, themselves or with in partnership with a private ISP, small or large, um, they they are eligible to apply. Now, how well they there are, um, and and I'm sorry, I'm not the bead expert. There are two of us, so we have split the baby, <laughs> and I am more uh, equipped to talk about the digital equity side of the things than my my partner, uh, my other FPO for California, Marina McClatchy, is the bead, is, is focusing on bead, but on, on the eligibility, when an application goes into bead eventually, the, how well that eligible entity can deliver, um, will also play into the calculation of whether of their application. Does that make sense? So an entity that may not be as um, uh, experienced, a smaller ISP that has less capacity, less experience versus a larger ISP in partnership with jurisdictions might do better um, depending if that makes sense. Does that make sense, Andrew? That, no, no, that makes sense. And if you do have that listserv, how to subscribe to that, that would be kind of maybe in the chat if there's a kind of email we should do okay. that with. I'll get that to you and Carla after the meeting. I don't have that okay. just off, um, at my fingertips right now, but yes. Sure. 
Yeah, okay. and you can be, and there are two ways there. If you're not, if you've never been involved with the CPUC, you can either become an official party to a proceeding, which is much more kind of lawyered up and um, an official, or you be, you can become kind of a listening party, um, not party, but a listening organization where you are just kind of watching what uh, the rules and the discussions and the um, um, the comments um, that are submitted so that you can kind of just keep abreast of the, the proceeding. Um, and so, but for some organizations, be, becoming an official party is, you know, if they want to have a legal uh, stake at the table. All right. Well, we are also thrilled. Thank you so much, Gladys. And we're also happy to have with us today, Scott Adams and Ana Lacona from the California Department of Technology. And it is Scott's office and his team that are actually putting this digital equity plan together. Scott has long um, roots in San Francisco and affiliated with the Tech Council. And I know that he and Marie Jobling especially go way back. And so great to see all of these configurations, but we'll um, let the two of you take it away. Thank you, Carla. And hello, everyone. It's uh, so nice to see so many familiar faces. Um, and happy to uh, follow Gladys and talk about the, um, <clears throat> the, the statewide collaborative efforts to uh, work towards digital equity in California. Um, Anna, could you advance the slide? Thank you. Um, so again, we've been asked to come and give an introduction to the state digital equity planning process. Um, wanted to again introduce myself for those of you who don't know me. My name is Scott Adams. I'm the deputy director of the excuse me, the Office of Broadband and Digital Literacy at the California Department of Technology. And um, our office is responsible for coordinating the state's various, um, well, the state's Broadband for All program and the related um, initiatives to achieve um, digital equity in the state. Next slide, please. I I think is, is um, you know, the past conversation alluded to, wanted to underscore that that broadband for all from the state's perspective and is really outlined by the historic efforts of the, the California Broadband Council, which is a, a 12 member multi-agency coordinating um, entity at the state that really um, coordinates broadband deployment and adoption efforts throughout the state and out in unserved communities as determined by the PUC. Um, our work was uh, informed during the pandemic by the governor's broadband executive order and then um, which directed the broadband council to make the state um, wide broadband action plan which is the broadband for all action plan and um, you know when we talk about digital equity the the state's broadband for all program acknowledges that access affordability and adoption are all critical components of digital equity and that you know the ultimate goal is that, that we have a, a you know universal um, population that is digitally literate and included and able to um, um, access government services and experience all of the social and economic benefits that come with being online. Next slide. So <clears throat> Gladys did a really good job. So thanks Gladys for um, making my job easier. What <clears throat> we want to make sure we underscore is that broadband for all in California has been Really, it's in flight, and there are already um, over six and a half billion dollars that were um, allocated to broadband for all to um, to to the <laughs> Department of Technology and our office to develop a, a ten thousand mile statewide open access middle mile network to kind of offset the cost model that is prohibiting current incumbents from deploying their last mile networks and unserved and underserved communities and out to anchor institutions and that is underway. We collaborate on a on a weekly, if not daily basis with the PUC, as Gladys's slide showed, there's the California Advanced Service Fund um, legacy programs and then the 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 programs funded by Senate Bill 156, like the federal funding account, the loan loss reserve uh, account, and the local agency technical assistance program. Um, so those get us to the Infrastructure Investment and Job Act. And what we're doing right now is the state is leveraging all federal dollars through the IJA to create the next chapters in the state's digital equity plan and, and approach. And so as 
Gladys said, the Department of uh, Technology is the administering entity for the uh, digital equity planning program. The Public Utilities Commission is the administering entity for the broadband equity access and deployment program. Um, both of these planning processes to, to save um, um, planning and engagement fatigue, um, you know, from the stakeholder perspective and our perspective are being coordinated and done really, um, um, you know, with our, our shoulders locked together. Um, there is, a, a, you know, statutory requirement and both by our state's own values, a need to do extensive statewide uh, and local engagement and to really want to solicit input from um, regional and local communities and stakeholders and partners to develop um, uh, and beat in digital equity plans that work for the state of California and really close the digital divide. And I think the big thing that, that Gladys showed is that when both of these plans are completed, and I think that's an important step um, to note as people were asking about that, we're in the middle of developing the digital equity and bead five-year action plans, which will then determine how uh, digital equity <laughs> capacity and bead dollars are formed. And that's what's so important that we really reach out and partner with folks like you to have your voice be heard and um, let us know where the gaps are and how we can divert or should divert future funding. Next slide, please. So as Gladys talked about, these are the eight covered populations that are called out in the Digital Equity Act. And that's kind of the distinction, Richard, between um, I think the color coding is that the Digital Equity Act and the bead nofo um, outline uh, separate but kind of overlapping covered populations. And these are important, I'm not gonna read them all, but um, all of the state's planning efforts and investments have to be um, really prioritized for these eight covered populations who are the most impacted by um, digital inequities and the digital divide, divide as, as all of you know. Next slide, please. So the planning process that um, we have developed in coordination with the PUC, we've tried to do it in a way that is um, as cross-cutting as possible and, and affords um, partners and stakeholders as many opportunities as possible to engage based on their capacity. And so at the very high level, um, the state has uh, developed a statewide planning group, which is an expansion of the Broadband Council, and it includes 22 state agencies that have um, a vested interest in digital equity and a direct connection to providing services to the eight covered populations and have um, specific subject matter expertise on the policy outcomes that the digital equity plan <laughs> will work to um, address. We've uh, established outcome area working groups that uh, thus far we've done two rounds of these that have included over 700 um, entities from across the state. And these are state agencies, local and regional entities, nonprofits, philanthropies, ISPs, um, to bring together and really answer some of the key questions that um, you know we're directed to address um, in order to complete our plan and, and get the future capacity dollars. Um, data is going to be really important. So collecting data and using that to inform our decisions. Uh, we have a number of digital equity surveys that you'll hear about uh, from Anna. One is to um, help us conduct an asset inventory of existing programs and resources in the state working towards digital equity. The other one is to help us uh, acquire um, specific information about the needs and barriers of eight covered populations. And then um, the last two components are um, you know, knowing it's critically important to get from behind the screen, given we're talking about digital equity um, in partnership with the Public Utilities Commission, other state entities and local partners, we're conducting um, 20, uh, we call them broadband for all digital equity and uh, bead planning workshops across the state. So these are gonna be in every economic region, um, kind of overlaid with the broadband consortia regions. And um, you'll hear more about the, the first five events that are planned uh, really up around the corner, starting in mid April. And then lastly, um, part of, you know, how we can, can you continue to keep our partners and stakeholders involved is through 
uh, uh, ongoing public engagement through the Broadband for All portal, um, through our monthly email updates that we send out to folks, and um, <laughs> individual meetings and consultations, and um, you know, ad hoc or, or one-off webinars that we'll host. Um, like with PUC, we just did one on the FCC mapping process. We're going to do another one coming up around the corner on another issue. Next slide, please. Real quickly, I talked about the outcome area working groups. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the Digital Equity Act in the NOFO says that states need to um, identify digital equity barriers for the covered populations, work to overcome those, and tie them back to key policy priorities um, for the state. And so the uh, working groups we've established are on education, health, digital literacy and inclusion, essential services, accessibility, and civic engagement, workforce and economic development, and tribal collaboration. And um, really, it, I know some of you have been participating in those. We invite you, if you have time, to come and lend your expertise, because we know that there's a lot of uh, wisdom and knowledge in this group and a lot of subject matter expertise that folks from around the state could benefit from. Next slide. This right here is a timeline that is ever changing as all of you know, working in public mm -hmm. service with multiple stakeholders um, and multiple entities, things change, but this gives you a rough idea of the, the timeline and all the multiple moving parts that we need to put together to develop the digital equity plan. And there's a similar and even compressed timeline for the Public Utilities Commission on the, the, the B plan. So no need to memorize this. We'll share our presentation with you. Um, Anna, next slide. Thanks. And I'm gonna turn this over to Anna. We wanted this to be kind of a two-way conversation. So um, she was gonna tee up a couple of questions we wanted to ask you all. Thank you, Scott. Hi everyone, my name is Anna Lacona and I'm here with Scott and the Broadband Equity Partnership and we're supporting uh, the Office of Broadband Digital Literacy in um, creating the State Digital Equity Plan. And like Scott mentioned in our previous outcome area working groups, we've really made it a bi-directional conversation where we wanna hear from community members and we really wanna hear lived experiences and really ask questions and address and get to the root of what um, digital equity barriers exist. So we want to pose those questions to you all too here. And we're opening up the chat. Feel free to use the chat or raise your hand. And we really want to take some time to hear you and, and hear what your experience has been with um, digital equity. So I'm going to go to the next slide and present three questions. And I'll go ahead and read them. Uh, but feel free to uh, raise your hand and speak on any of them. But the first question is, what digital equity barriers exist for the eight covered populations? The second question is, how do digital equity barriers impact disparate outcomes in education, health, workforce development, and access to essential services and civic participation? And our third question is, what programs have been successful to eliminate digital equity barriers in the Bay Area? Um, and I'll go ahead and put the eight covered populations again in the chat. If um, there's eight of them, so there might be a lot, but we would love to hear from you. Uh, feel free to raise your hand or or use the chat. And if you have any reactions or thoughts to any of these questions. Yes, um, I do see Justin in the chat listed. Language is a large barrier. And thank you for um, elaborating that. We, um, as, part of, as part of our efforts, we definitely are taking that into consideration. And as Scott will explain later on, we are incorporating multiple languages in our surveys and our DEAM tools. So we um, thank you. Can you all hear me now? Yes, we can hear you okay, now. Okay, great. Well, we have a number of um, tech trainers on this call and it would be really great if the, if you wouldn't mind um, I'm putting you on the spot, but um, I know that they work with older adults and adults with disabilities and they see firsthand every single day what some of those barriers are. So Molly, Maya, um, uh, Wanda, if you could chime in here, this would be great. Marie. <laughs> I also see Ray with their hand up as well. All right. 
Yeah, okay. Maybe I will talk about our Chinese uh, uh, senior, because I work with our Chinese senior every day today, because the most the problem now, because you know, yeah, our senior, both of them, they live by themselves, especially during the pandemic. Yeah, they really, yeah, need, yeah, help, yeah, to the communicate their families, yeah, and their doctors. Yeah, they, some of them, of yeah, course, the, the lucky one, they could, they connect me earlier, just after the pandemic. Yeah, but a few, they just, yeah, yeah, find out my programs, they really love them, they tell, they tell me they really like a uh, depressed at home because yeah they really have a hard time yeah even they have the phone but they don't know how to use it and also they cannot communicate with their their families also their doctors also uh, also one hour actually one hour uh participant yeah she's uh eighty years old she actually uh, she got diagnosed just after the pandemic. Yeah, so she needs the phone. Yeah, to to communicate. But she lives by herself. She needs a phone to uh, her families and the doctors. And then yeah, when she yeah call me because she yeah, she get connect me with her her neighbor. So she get to me. So I I spend hours yeah to work with her. To get her, her iPhone message, and the iPhone, the Apple ID, yeah, correct before she can get, she can get into the download the Zoom. But at that time, she already have the, the, the stomach, yeah, cancer. So she, <laughs> that's so so tough to, yeah, to. To work her at the time, because I know she's sick, but she's also her phone is not working before, because the senior before they get a a phone before, like she have the the pay as you go phone, so the number she already disconnected. So I spent a long time to get her kind of yeah, great made made the phone. Yeah, phone number and also get the Zoom and then she got then the, uh, so with the doctor and families. Now she's so happy. Now she's she really recovered now. Yes. Great. Yeah, she lived by herself. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. And, uh, yeah. Wanda, I just wanted to ask you one question. How many um students do does Chinese students um do you see every you and your trainers train every week? Oh, actually, for us, our Chinese team, we have uh, 20 computer basic classes. Yeah, every week, we have 20 class in our team. Classes? But mostly, yeah, 20. So we have got some uh, uh, are smaller, some are bigger. But most are, are 10 up to 20. Some of them are 20 to 30. Sometimes I go into 40 students. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah, in, cool. yeah, of course they not only yeah come to the class, they also they come to the class, they also see each other. Yeah, some of them even they don't know they don't learn that much uh, they, they know so they're a senior, they don't really need much yeah. Great. Everyone's coming skills that come and yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um let's just jump in. So Ray, did you have your hand and then Justin? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, thank you. <clears throat> I just wanted to kind of lift up the work that Wanda was just talking about, um, especially with folks who need language access. Uh, San Francisco is really closely looking at that as uh, a shining model. It's like creating these intergenerational hubs, uh, like one of our grantees from our digital equity portfolio, Chinatown CDC. Uh, they actually employ uh, a high school age young people to help facilitate workshops for older adults to help them kind of manage because uh, there's a lot of, you know, family that are overseas back home who, you know, they want to communicate with. So they leverage tools like WhatsApp, 
Um, they also require the students to give presentations to kind of, you know, not only, you know, take the information, but apply it and teach it to others, which helps with retention. So it's models like that. It's models like um, uh, SF Goodwill, who helps uh, one of the identified populations in the presentation was, uh, I know it says incarcerated, but I'm thinking you were talking about reentry folks. So folks who are coming into society who uh, are coming into a world with, you know, it doesn't necessarily resemble what they remember when they when they uh, when they came out, uh, when they when they uh, were first or before they went in. Right. And so kind of having that facilitated experience where you have digital navigators, uh, special shout out to CTN, who does it, that model really well and facilitating the process of getting a person acclimated to, you know, what the standard is now. Um, and speaking of standard, uh, San Francisco, I'm kind of switching gears here, has a digital accessibility and inclusion standard which uh, recognizes, excuse me, language access as a, a big barrier. And we're addressing that. Um, we have our, our content, our, our vital information uh, featured in five of our major languages, four of our major languages that are spoken in San Francisco. And uh, the, the content has to read at a uh, fifth grade reading education level roughly, right? So folks who, um, folks who, you know, may not, have an education level, uh, you know, that exceeds that, you know, can also participate and, and receive and, uh, you know, uh, vital information and act on vital information. So I just wanted to quickly say that. So that that's, those are some barriers that, uh, to, to answer question number one. Uh, Justin, jump on in. Sure. Afternoon, everyone. So I work for the uh, Center for Elders Independence. It's a PACE organization, all-inclusive care for the elderly. Our folks are 55 to 105. You know, one other than the language, what we've also seen as a huge barrier is tech support, right? The folks that get the the devices for internet, you know, let's say Comcast or whoever it is, they drop it off. But, I mean, the elderly have no idea what to do with it, right? So... <laughs> You know, we've got uh, a person that can help out put that in place. And then just going forward after they, you know, get some classes, they may have some questions, you know, uh, in between the classes where they have, you know, um, accessing tech support is vital, you know, to keep that continuity and moving them forward for you know, understanding how to use the devices, right? So that's just, that's a resource. And I, I know that there's more organizations that's trying to provide tech support, which is great. But that is still a barrier. I know, Wendy, you've been uh, chatting back and forth. What can, what would you like to add to the conversation? <laughs> I'm and I'm I'm in a pretty noisy environment, so I've been trying to stay on okay. mute. Um, but uh, but I, I put a link in um, in the chat to um, Alameda County Age Friendly Council's um, survey and report. Um, that really identified a, a number of interesting disparities, definitely among people of color, as well as um, uh, differences in um, um, in access based on um, on income. Um, but I think that for for us, the most striking um, learning um, from the effort was that there are. Um, communities in, especially in the Latinx communities that in, in, in our county, um, that are quite, um, uh, suspicious and, um, and in fact afraid of, um, efforts to connect. Um, and so what we, we did some deep diving into that. Um, to really try to tease out what was what was going on and did some separate surveys um, in in Spanish um, in the community. And what we what we found was that there really need to be some um, some solutions that take into account the um, the likelihood that many older adults, who are um, uh, not um, who, whose immigration status is questionable 
or they're worried about that issue, they're not going to be connected, but they still need to access some of the services, um, applications, tools. Um, and so what we recommended um, in the report was that um, uh, community health workers or other or peer um, support uh, promotoras um, be able to provide digital access, that that be a part of the set of skills um, that community workers have for working with populations so that um, so that they can assist people who can, you know, to access what they need to access without um, feeling like they're compromising their safety. Um, I know you have your hand up, um, Richard, but I just want to jump to um, put uh, Ben Chen on the spot just for a second if you're with us. Ben, are there any barriers that um, jump out in, the, in terms of the population that you're serving or that you'd like to highlight? Yeah, was, and I was actually just putting something in the chat, but uh, right. for, for folks with disabilities, I think financial barriers, uh, similar to many of these other groups, are uh, can prevent access to internet or owning devices. But the main things that I was kind of putting in there were uh, accessibility barriers on websites and apps. So like, for example, over the last several years, um, folks who are blind had trouble accessing public meetings, information online, using screen readers, because some of those things aren't uh, necessarily built into the a lot of the uh, spaces, the digital spaces that we use to get information or to sign up for vaccines, those kinds of things. Um, and then the other thing I was just thinking of was limit folks with limited mobility often have to use adaptive equipment to actually use uh, use devices. So um, that's often an additional step. It's an additional expense and it requires uh, some more specialized training as well. So uh, on top of just how to use the actual device itself or connect to the internet, there's a, an additional piece like a switch or a button that has to be set up and folks need to know how to use that and set that up for those individuals. Great, thank you. Yeah, I would, I would I, I, here, of course, for the people who had the mobilities, some, a lot of ours, our participants, actually they are humbang, they cannot go out. So we really need to have a lot of time because they they don't have much uh, technical skills. We spend hours and hours to help them to set up for our Chinese course. We we help them to yeah uh, set up the WeChat and email. So really, yeah, we need a lot of time because they, even we open now still for this kind of participants. Still, they cannot come out. Yeah. So you're going like getting to people directly for people who can't leave their houses. And that's like another whole nut that we haven't even been talking about. And it takes, and you're right, hours and hours of time um, to try to get somebody successfully hooked up and connected and able to use their devices. Thank you, Richard. And then we'll, I'll, I'll ask you, Scott, to see if you have, if you want to jump in or what your plan is. But Richard, why yeah. don't you jump in? I, I, I'm just going to say something briefly, and it's something that I've been more concerned about, and it's just sort of come to mind and to me in the last few months. And it, 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 it doesn't have to do so much with the characteristics of the covered populations as it does with the very definition of digital equity, because I think it's a moving target. And I think that we are currently just in within the last year, the last six months, there is a major paradigm shift going on in terms of what digital equity is. And that is the emergence of, you know, what is being called sort of generative AI and large language models uh, that is, is uh, creating an entirely new category of digital services. And this really struck me this weekend when I talked to my granddaughter who's 18 years old and I mentioned things like chat GPT and she just said very casually, oh, I use that every day. Uh, that's that's just become part of my everyday uh, reality. And that is you know, something which is probably totally strange, totally unknown uh, to most of these covered populations and probably something for which the trainers have really had limited access. So all I'm saying is even as we're dealing with these covered populations and these very real barriers, I think we should also keep an eye on the definition of what we really mean by full participation in digital equity. 
Excellent point. It's almost like we, you know, it's like you get to one level and you're still out of reach. <laughs> well, and I mean, it's the thing that is unique about digital technology is it's not one thing. It's something which is continuing to evolve. And in fact, I just heard a, a talk by somebody very knowledgeable who said it is now increase the rate of which in which this digital technology is changing is now double exponential speed, which is sort of scary. Mm. Wow. All right. Yeah. Well, um, uh, Scott, uh, I don't know if you want to jump in or what what you'd like to do. Oh man, I would love to jump in. I mean, it's it's uh um really it's so good to hear from the the experts about the the local knowledge and perspective, and it's um and really it's so good. It feels like being at home, like amongst this crowd with the the various folks that I've worked with. But I think that um. You know, as it mentioned before, there's the the standards. We know that that access, affordability, and adoption um, are digital equity barriers, and we know that there are common, um, you know, barriers to broadband adoption associated with cost of services and devices and relevance and training. But I think that what such a unique perspective that folks here talk about is the dimensionality of um, both the digital divide here and you know looking at the um, the disabled population and um, really appreciated Ben's comments about accessibility of services that are that are online and having those really be accessible to disabled you know population and and the the dimensionality of needs in terms of devices um, particularly for disabled folks and even seniors I know in my past work with um, with Marie and and community living campaign and the, the the tech council, we've learned a lot about that. Um, so just, you know, really excited to, to to be in this space and to have this conversation with you all and to, to bring in your knowledge to the state's digital equity um, planning process, because that's really, this is our moment. I mean, we have uh, not once in a generation, but once in a hundred year investments to close the digital divide and all of the platitudes you hear about um, you know, uh, building back better and meeting the moment. Um, this is our time. We have uh, federal, state, and uh, local leadership aligned policy and, and funding aligned to um, to solve this issue. And so um, how do, you know, beyond infrastructure, which is key, and we're investing billions in that, how do we not miss this moment to address the other things that we haven't been able to fund, like, you um, the things that broadband adoption programs, digital literacy training, um, tech support, digital navigation. Um, we didn't even really get a chance to hear from Marie on the, the work that CLC has been doing on um, senior workforce development. And I know Ray and folks in San Francisco are doing that. I think that's the way that, that at least the state is ambitiously and optimistically looking at developing the plan that it's like um, digital equity is the baseline but we want to go above and beyond that. And so, um, you know, how can we have equity of, of opportunity, um, equity of, of access to essential services and, and equity in being able to realize the economic and social benefits that, um, that all folks should be able to experience in this internet and tech centric world that, that we live in. Um, I also want to give out a, a shout out to Richard because Richard, you brought up, um, the role of, of AI and chat GBT and actually Ray show showed up um, at one of our um, working group meetings and asked the same question. And at the time it kind of um, took me off guard um, in terms of, of how to think about that, but really would love to continue to work with you all as thought partners about um, how we should be thinking about AI. I mean, there's always the, the, the potential positive promise of what AI can do and the unintended consequences of what, you know, AI might do um, in terms of plagiarism and, and other things. I have a 14 year old daughter um, and I take the humanity out of some of the interactions, but um, I'll, I'll just stop there because I see more people have their hands up and- um, Paolo Salta more. has his hand up. Why don't you jump in, Paolo? Hey, Paolo. Paulo, you're still muted. 
Hey guys. Uh, hey Scott, good to see you. Um, one of the, uh, I mean, I, I agree with everyone here. I think increasing um, internet access for everyone, making that easier, making sure the um, subscription navigation process to get anyone online is, should be improved. Also getting devices out. Um, I also agree with the accessibility part of things. Um, having more of those, like the, what the Independent Living Resource Center has in San Francisco, having more of those libraries where folks in the disability community can come in, try out the dif uh, different accessible AT devices that they might need, and having kind of a, a pathway to fund um, and help folks with those devices if they need it. Um, but the one thing that I want to talk about more is centered around digital services and more of our services are going to be online. Um, there's this, um, you know, this this component of privacy. So I sometimes think about how we can better um, help all of our partners that are providing digital literacy, and maybe we can create some sort of guidelines around any digital services that are coming online. There has to be some sort of accessibility component and a tool for our training partners so that they can access a dummy account or a dummy platform so that there isn't this kind of you put out a platform, you guys figure it out, you guys do the work. There is that component as they're creating this new platform, as they're creating these digital services. There is, they're also listening and kind of looking at the accessibility of things and getting people learning it quickly by arming our digital literacy partners um, with the tools they need. Um, that's come into mind here as they te uh, check their um, their VA status. Sometimes it's a very simple like access online, but there is privacy you know um, limitations there as well. So when you have nonprofits navigating this land and really trying to help the constituents that or the community that they're in, um, it it does create a big barrier for them because they do a lot more research. But if the creators of these platforms kind of look at it as well and say, we need to provide the tools for these people that can help the people that we're serving, I think that would help out a lot. I'll just stop there. Great. I know that Gladys has her hand up and then um, Ray does. And I just want to follow up on what Paulo is saying. A really great example of those platforms is the Epic Health Records. So most people's health records are linked that way. Epic does not provide a dummy platform. So the trainers that have around San Francisco that we've know that we know that have been trying to help their seniors access records have been using their own <laughs> medical charts and blanking out their names because there's nothing else. I mean, they're going far beyond the call of duty, but there aren't other choices. Um, all right, so what do we have, uh, Gladys and then Ray? Sure, just really quickly, I just wanted to jump in and say thank you so much for this conversation, Carla. Mm -hmm. I think these are the conversations, Scott knows how excited I am right now because these are, <laughs> we've always we've talked about <clears throat> over and over again, hearing from grassroots organizations rather than grass tops where I think Scott and I kind of live uh, too much of our time, but these are the conversations that really excite us. And these are the voices that need to be heard. Um, on that note, I put in the chat an opportunity, another opportunity for you all to um, engage and making sure that the NOFO is coming out for the two tranches of money that are coming up for NTIA for digital equity capacity grants, as well as the competitive grants are shaped and formed by, by the knowledge that you all have as experts on the ground. So I really encourage you guys to look at that in chat. I also sent, just sent Carla and, um, and Andrew, my my presentation. So the links are there as well. Um, there is a webinar tomorrow to kind of show everyone how best what what this is all about, what the nofos are about, and what your voices, what difference your voices will make in the in the um, drafting of the nofos. So there's a webinar tomorrow. There are instructions in the chat on links to how to do that. Um, my contact information for any. Um, questions you might have in there is also a summary uh, from the Benton Institute that helps kind of summarize why this is important to organizations like all of you. So that's all. Thanks. Thank you. Well, let Ryan, let's jump to you and then Ray, because we haven't heard from you, Ryan, and, and um, we're really happy to have you here. You've been such a great Baytic participant and member. Oh, thank you, Colin. Sorry, Ray. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I just wanted to mention that um, 
I'm excited to announce that we're about to sign a contract with Santa Clara County for their access to technology grant, where we'll be rolling out uh, multilingual programming to low income participants. One thing that we have found really helpful is partnerships. So we are working with Televisit and Aki, because that has meant that we are playing to our comparative advantages where Senior Planet can provide our programming that we are um, focused on, while Aki as a health clinic and um, uh, connected to affordable housing units has been able to verify income to ensure that we are reaching the most socially isolated, uh, most neediest of um, participants. Um, and so, for example, we received um, some pilot dollars from our area agency on agent, um, aging uh, a couple of years ago, where we were contracted to deliver programming for 25 participants in Mandarin. At one point, we had 144 participants in our session, and that's because there's a large need for language programming um, locally. So just wanted to mention the importance of partnerships, especially in um, the fact that community organizations are trusted entities in communities that have a network and access to um, communities of color that we might not be able to access otherwise. Thanks, and sorry again, Ray. No. Okay, Ray, you... jump in. Just... <laughs> no, that was actually perfect because uh, Ryan kind of teed up what I was going to talk about anyway, which is which is partnerships. And um, one of the great uh, things that yielded from the relationship with NTIA is because when you, if you go to their meetings, uh, another Ryan, I forgot his last name, Whelan, uh, you know, and their team, they actually give you exposure to your counterparts or other folks across the country who are trying to solve the same problem, who have probably solved the, the same problem you're looking to get solved. Uh, so I, I would say is, is start to reach beyond the, the county lines, the state lines. Um, and NTIA has been has been great at, at making those introductions or creating environments where we can introduce ourselves and, and glean from our partners uh, across the nation. Um, and also, uh, Paolo kind of catalyzed the idea of of access and, you know, accessibility and um, designing uh, human-centered design or user-centered design in a way, right, is uh, one one thing we looked at for the city and county of San Francisco is how are San Franciscans engaging with content? Is it on their phones? Is it on tablets? Is it on computers? Is it laptops? And so that's one thing that we took a look at and really making, like, for instance, our um, housing portal to sign up for housing, affordable housing, Dahlia, uh, we've uh, worked with our digital, so another thing, partnerships, internal partnerships. So digital equity I had to work with the, our digital services department to figure out um, how do we get rid of all these duplicate accounts? Because folks, one of the biggest barriers, and I was just reading an invoice today, is passwords. It's like, right, folks will forget their password or folks are like, you know, I don't know. I don't know. This is making me frustrated. I want to move on to something else. It's, it's those factors that are commonly underrated and overlooked that need to be looked at. And so one of the things we looked at is like magic link or single sign on, just making access, you know, we want to, we want to make the process as streamlined and as fluid as possible. Um, so UI UX design. Um, I think that's, those are other, so user interface and user experience design. I, I'm wondering if we can get something off the ground as a state to kind of guide that, and making sure that, you know, at minimum, whatever platform you're using can be accessed from um, a lifeline phone, not uh, folks usually say Obama phones, but a lifeline phone um, or uh, or whatnot. Uh, one one program that has been successful that I would say has helped eliminate a barrier. So question three is if, if folks want to look at the SF service guide. And so essential services like uh, housing, food, um, you know, healthcare, um, even internet and, you know, devices and and digital literacy training is featured on the service guide because we work collaboratively um, across departments and and um, with our uh, grantees and, and CBO partners. So I know I've taken up a lot of time. I just, I'll stop there. Thank um, you. Thank you. Marie, I just want to call on you for a second. You've got, had some notes in the chat, but you've been at this for a long time. Um, you helped get the SF Tech Council started and, and um, main supporter. Um, what would you want to add in to this conversation? That 
<clears throat> well, I'm really grateful that the Tech Council is around right now because I think it is an incredible time and there are opportunities that we haven't seen since I've been paying attention to this stuff. Um, and I, I do um, appreciate the fact that Scott and others are keeping um, the work here in mind and some of the things that we've been able to accomplish because I think we can learn from each other around the Bay, around the country. Um, and I'm hoping that we have a vehicle to kind of share that knowledge as we go forward. So it's an exciting time. Hey. One, one person we have not heard from, Steve Lipson. I just want to make sure that um, if, if there's anything you'd like to add to this conversation. Uh, yeah, there is actually. Uh, <laughs> thanks, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I just wanted to add to uh, to one thing to to uh, what Richard had said about digital equity as a moving target. That uh, actually, I would add digital literacy to that. Because it's, you know, standard language uh, literacy is relatively easy compared to digital literacy. You know what the components are. We know what the components are. <clears throat> and we can use the term literacy fairly easily. But with the dig in the digital domain, it's not that easy. So even with the introduction of stuff like ChatGPT and, and MidJourney and <clears throat> the AI tools, um, we really have to look at... Uh, how we're going to define digital literacy and to point out that the standard pathways for education for including uh, digital education for older adults has been cleaved and sort of zeroed out by the state so there are adult ed programs but there are no longer with the exception i think of uh, san francisco and san francisco county um, those opportunities are really zeroed out across the straight the state unless older adults are willing to uh, do it through the community college networks. So uh, it, it makes, you know, there are service organizations and nonprofits like uh, uh, community tech network, uh, uh, tech network that, that do such a great job, but there's no uh, established state or um program that allows older adults to learn that way. And I should say one more thing, sorry. Um, we've been working with ChatGPT and MidJourney with older adult cohorts, and the interactions are really pretty mind blowing, so. Awesome. Well, maybe uh, that's another session, Steve. Maybe we'll have to have you present on that. That would be extremely interesting. Um, well, we're coming to 212, and I know there's a couple of things that Scott and Anna need to like, uh, um, tell us about in terms of urgent participation. There are two things, a survey um, and another kind of things. How to take action. Did I get, did I get it right? <laughs> yes. But Carla, I just wanted to know, is there any way to extend this meeting for another hour? <laughs> would be nice, would be nice, right? We, we still have like 15 minutes, so whoever can hang on. Yeah. We've we've got a wealth of knowledge on this call, and people have put have many years of experience and are very devoted to the cause. So, again, thank you all for being here. But let's make sure we can hear about how we can take action, and then we can see if we have more time for um, comments or questions. Uh, anything to add before we get into action items? I just want to say that um, you know, Paulo, um, Richard, um, Ben, Ray. Um, the essential services piece is that that's like, this is what the digital equity plan is about. And, and I see that there was a, a question um, that Molly asked about how much does California invest is really the goal of the digital equity plan is like to invest in those things we haven't invested in and to support others. And so love the conversation about, um, in our view, all services are essential services if you need to be online to connect to them. And so the kind of conversation we want to facilitate is if you if you provide services online, what responsibility are you taking to make those services accessible um, and to making sure that you're connecting vulnerable populations to the Internet so that they have equitable access to those. And so it, the California Department of Technology, um, we have universal standards for web design that factor in like literacy levels, language levels. Um, things like that. I think we want to go above and beyond is like form, um, you know, how easy are forms and processes to use online that are efficient. You know, language is a big issue. We have OCR bot and other remediation and accessibility standards. And 
Um, and Carla, please forgive me because I know you're trying to move us along. Oh, no, no, it's fine. Go ahead. This is, <laughs> this is really been an aha moment of folks that we want to pull into the essential services conversation because what we're kind of looking is like, how can we meaningfully make a difference in essential services? Because the Department of Technology in the state, they have a, 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 a not just a blueprint, they have guidelines. But like what we hear from, from Paulo is like, it's more than just that. Like, we can't just say like, here's your toolkit, here's your samples, go do it. We know even beyond San Francisco, the smaller communities and towns, the smaller organizations are gonna need support and assistance. So um, to implement those, so just really excited about this whole conversation, but excited about, um, and not surprised at the direction that this group took that conversation. So I'm just really thankful for, um, you know, uplifting, uh, the need to do that and and the work that's already being done and how that could be shared with others. Thank you, Scott. And thank you everyone for participating. And the conversation doesn't end there. We have a series of action items and uh, we wanna share with you all how you can participate and help us in these efforts. And to start, we are we have launched a digital equity ecosystem mapping tool, which we are calling TEAM. As part of our state digital and as part of the federal requirements, we're required to do an asset inventory of what programs are already offered, what services exist in the state of California, and how can we map this and so we know what's missing. So the DEAM tool is live and we are sharing with you all the link. I'll put it in the chat. And again, it's a way for us to track all the digital equity programs in the state of California, including plans, services, and resources. And we invite you all to um, fill it out. Uh, we really want to hear your voice. A lot of you have mentioned great programs already. Uh, Wanda mentioned 20 classes uh, per week, I think Wanda said. So we, we want to know about those programs. We want to make sure that we are tracking them and that we're mapping them in our California ecosystem. So again, the DEAM tool is live and we invite you all to, to go ahead and fill it out. We are also offering the DEAM tool in Spanish. So we um, I'm also put the Spanish version link in the chat. And as part of the, as part of this effort, we're also we also created a partner toolkit. So if you can share with your uh, partners and other organizations about them filling out the DEAM tool, that would be great. Yes, please share with other organizations in your network as Gladys has mentioned. So there's a toolkit. Um, and yes, we look forward to reading and uh, looking at all your responses. And with that, I'll hand it over to Scott. Yeah, so um, thank you, Anna, and really wanted to issue another call to action for this group. Um, uh, as part of the digital equity um, plan, we're also required to do, um, to identify individual barriers of the of the covered populations and um, identify needs. And so we're doing that at multiple levels. We're doing a statewide scientific, you know, phone survey with the um, California Emerging Technology Fund. Um, doubling, you know, the sample size of what they customarily do, but knowing that's going to be limited, we have um, worked with Broadband Equity Partnership to develop um, an online mobile-friendly version of the digital equity public survey, and um, what is cool about it is we've got a lot of input from the ecosystem, and um, we're currently getting the, the tool um, translated into 14 different languages. We're also um, creating um, audio files for each of the questions for folks with um, sight impairment or low levels of literacy. We expect that that is going to be um, live and ready to go um, sometime in mid-April. And so really issuing a call to action to you folks. It's it's not just our survey, it's your survey too, um, to help us spread this far and wide to individual residents, um, particularly those who aren't often um, captured. Like we're, we're basing this on assumption that mobile phones are, are relatively ubiquitous. So to the extent that, you know, we can share this with folks, we want to get as much granular data from folks in all 58 counties and really an oversample of the covered populations 
um, to inform our decisions. So that's just, it's something we're really excited about. We know um, that there's a challenge, but when this is ready, we would really appreciate if you guys could help us um, push that out. We're hoping to get, you know, over 20,000 responses from across the state and would appreciate your partnership in, in making that happen. So here is um, just a slide about other ways to um, get involved in terms of, you know, uh, I think you all should be or will be getting updates from us on a monthly basis. The digital equity mapping tool, Anna shared it with you. Um, the digital equity survey, it's coming soon. And then um, uh, please encourage your participation. Might even could be reaching out to some of you to see if you'll come speak at our uh, next working group meetings as subject matter experts um, on those issues. The next slide, Anna. Um, we have in total, um, because Gladys meets with us once a, a week and tells us we have to um, really leave no stone unturned and no partner um, unengaged with and unlearned from. Um, this is a, a slate of the upcoming events here. On the left-hand side, you'll see the uh, opportunity for virtual convenings that can be found on the Broadband for All portal. And then on the uh, right-hand side, there are just one, two, three, four, five, six of the um, 20 regional workshops that we'll be conducting. And um, I just can't thank you enough for um, the opportunity to be here with you and to learn from you and to, um, uh, you know, commune in the our shared interest of digital equity and closing the digital divide for those most vulnerable among us.